We are live. Welcome back. It is a cold, cold Tuesday evening. I am your host, Yusuf Hassan, and I'm back from vacation. Not really vacation. I went for Umrah, which, if you guys don't know, is a sequence of religious rites and passages uh, that a Muslim undertakes. Uh, you know, it's not obligatory. It's not mandatory. Uh, we just did it because my family and I were blessed enough to do so. And I am now bald. You'll realize that I don't have hair on my head, which is why this little cap, this little toupee, is not coming off. Um, not for the camera, at least. Everyone who's here can see it. So if you want to see it, come out to Brooklyn College. We are not doing Orgo. We're doing Gen Chem. So if that murders your, your uh, desire to be here, I do not blame you. <laughs> so we are going to do, we, we're almost at the end of the program. We're almost at the end of the program, right? And we decided one of the things we're going to do is we are going to take the AAMC sample exam, which is free, which is open source free information that the AAMC cannot sue me for. And we are going to dissect it section by section, step by step. And we're going to post it, and we're going to post all the descriptions and what sort of notes I would take and blah, blah, blah. And we'll do that another time. But for now, let's do a little bit of general chemistry, rapid review. Number one, because there's definitely going to be more than one. All right. So like I said, we're almost at the end of the program. Today's what, February 20th? Program's probably going to end in the first two weeks of April. So. Very sad, very sad to see you guys grow up, become big boys and girls, get into medical school. I'll be here. I'm sure you guys will be too. But you will forever have a special place in my heart since you were the first class I ever taught. All right, let's do it. So chapter one of general chemistry is an incredibly, incredibly high yield chapter. And it's deceptively high yield, because the thing is, it doesn't really come in in discrete questions all too often, but it'll be connected to passage questions, right? And it'll be connected in really, really strange ways, where it'll just sneak in atomic structure and like certain parts of like nuclear decay or you know like um, transition metal theory, blah blah blah. So they'll they'll say something about a d orbital, or not even about a d orbital. They'll tell you that a solution of a specific sort of salt, right? When you dissolve it, it produces color. And now you know what about the identity of that salt? It has to have a transition metal inside of it. Who remembers why transition metals produce color? It's a very weird sort of crystal field theory thing. Almost, almost. That's very close. It, it has to do with orbitals, but it's a specific orbital with the d orbital. Right, the d orbital. So the d orbital we know. So we have s, p, d, and f orbitals. We really never worry about the f orbital. We don't normally get that far with the MCAT. And we know the SPD orbitals, right? They can accommodate how many sublevels? One, three, and five, correct? So one, and then three, and then five. And then here, it's just the, the single s orbital. And we know that the wave function of the s orbital makes it look like this. The wave function of the p orbital makes it look like this. And the wave function of the d orbital makes it look like your sleep paralysis demon. Because there's so many different fucking kinds of it, and no one wants to memorize it. My sister had to because she went to pharmacy school. And then the f orbital is even crazier than that, right? And I guess one good thing to know is that the three p orbitals, they're px, py, and pz. Right? px, py, pz. Now, the d orbital is split, it's a split orbital. And I believe, I believe, I'm, I'm not a quantum chemist, right? But I believe the way that it splits is two lower levels and three upper levels. If someone knows better than I do, please correct me. It's either two lower and three upper or three lower and two upper. I believe it's two lower and three upper. I'm not 100% positive, right? But the thing is, we know that there is an energy gap, right, between, let's say that this is the nucleus of a specific atom, 
and this is n equals 1, and this is n equals 2, and this is n equals 3. So there's an energy gap between n equals 2 and n equals 3, right? And that's a pretty large energy gap. The energy gap between the sublevels of the d orbital is relatively small, relatively small, right? Also, if I sound a bit congested, it's because I am. I didn't get very good sleep last night. I'm still a little jet lagged. <coughs> The difference between the lower orbital, the lower sublevel, and the upper sublevel of the d orbital is very small in comparison to this. How do we get electrons to jump from n equals 2 to n equals 3? We have to irradiate them with light or energy or something, right? We irradiate with a photon, E equals HF, and it jumps a specific amount. And then when it comes back down, it releases a photon of light that is equal to the energy that it needed to jump up, correct? And that becomes a very big thing on the MCAT because they always ask you about this equation, this E equals HF equation. What's another way that we can write this equation? E equals HC over lambda, right? E equals HC over lambda. And the reason we can do that is because C equals lambda F. How do you derive these? Anyone remember how you kind of derive? Not, I'm not asking you to reinvent physics, right? But do you guys remember the units, how this worked, right? Because C is what? What is C? It is the speed of light, right? And that's in meters per second. And that means that wavelength is in meters. And that means that frequency is in s to the negative 1, or hertz. Because 1 hertz is just 1 per second. One what per second? One whatever it is per second. One wave front, one particle, one this, one that, right? Anyone remember what H is equal to? Very good. 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34. How do you remember 626? Anyone watch Lilo and Stitch? I think Stitch was experiment 626. Red Bull is so trash, dude. It's so bad. What do you mean so I just, I just didn't want to get a Celsius because a Red Bull is a lot less caffeine than a Celsius. And I'm already jet lagged, so I want to be able to sleep tonight. But I needed something to get me through the, the lecture. <clears throat> OK. So like I said, the d orbitals split very small energy level. So the thing is, you don't need to irradiate those electrons in order for them to jump up and down through the d orbital. So when the electrons jump up and down through the little d orbital, they're just like jittery little monsters, and they go up and down and up and down and up and down. They're constantly emitting what? Color. Color. Right? They're just constantly emitting color. That's not to say that when you look at the salts, it by itself, you're going to see color, right? That, that's not to say that. But when you dissolve it, or when you're a broken college student, and then you do this gen chem experiment where you take a stick and dip it in a little bit of water and then dip it in a salt of copper sulfate and then take that stick and put it over a fire and the fire begins to burn, I think it's green, right? It burns a certain color, that's when you see the color happen, right? Because you're inducing these changes when you burn it and also when you dissolve it. So those changes are easier to see. Right, right? Where's Laura? We need her. OK. Moving on. I'm going to put two things on the board. And you guys are going to have a visceral reaction to one of them and then be completely fine with another. Carbon. All right, ready? Which one makes you cringe? 
the right one. Why? You have to fill in every single sublevel before you start doubling up. What's that called? It's Hund's rule. This follows Hund's rule. Hund's rule, very good. If I had a Jolly Rancher, I'd give you one. <laughs> Hund's rule, very good. Wonderful. Now, who knows the difference between paramagnetic and diamagnetic? Right, so it's paired, right? Is that what you're going to say? What's a, what's a better way of thinking about that? If there is any unpaired electron, it's paramagnetic. And if all the electrons are paired, then it's diamagnetic. Which of those is what we call magnetic? Paramagnetic, right? So paramagnetic is what we know as magnetic. Diamagnetic is dimagnet. It's not a magnet, right? So diamagnetic would look like and normally, we're talking about the d orbital here, normally. Diamagnetic would look like this. And paramagnetic would be anything but that. Anything but that. And now this is where we separate the 520s from the 515s. All right. Let's take a look at that periodic table over there. Manganese. Four S two and three D. Three D what? Manganese. Someone count. I can't look all, all the way over there. Three D five. Titanium, vanadium, chromium, manganese four. Don't copy this down. You don't have to. I don't hate you that much. Why did I go to 4s before 3d? Because because you do. Because <laughs> you do. You guys ready? Give me the quantum numbers that define that electron. I'll get you started. You have N, L, M, L, and M, S. Go. If you're well-seasoned in general chemistry, this should be something you can do in your head. But that, if you can't, that doesn't mean you're bad. You just need to practice. These, these are the questions that, and this is literally, these are the types of questions that really separate the people who score exceptionally well on chemistry and physics versus doing well. Because the thing is, someone who is not as well seasoned will take a minute and a half, maybe a minute 45 on this question. Someone who's very well seasoned will take 20 seconds. And that's another minute and 10 seconds you can spend reading a passage, answering a harder question. 
et cetera. Well, what's the easiest one? N, right? What's N? 3. L. First of all, what is the range for L? So it's, it's 0, and then 1, and then 2, because n minus 1, right? So what's L over here? 1. Why? Because this is S, P, D. For n equals 3, L can equal this, because the third energy level has the S, P, and D sublevels. Very good. All right, what about ML? It's positive one, why? So for the P orbital, right, so let's, let's look at the S orbital. For the S orbital, it's only one of them, it's just zero. For the P orbital, since there's three of them, the middle one's zero, and this one's a negative one, and this one's positive one. For the D orbital, the middle one's zero, and it goes negative one, or sorry, negative 2, negative 1, 1, 2, right? So for this, it's 1. Now what's MS? Laura, how you doing? I'm surprised you showed up now that my hair's gone. Yeah, I'm surprised too. <laughs> what's MS? Plus 1 half. Plus 1 half. How do you do this quickly? How do you do this quickly? First of all, the moment they say manganese, I want you guys to snap to at least this part right here. Because they're probably not going to ask you about anything up here. This is all full, right? And like this is, this is relatively easy. In your head, or even on paper, I want you to have this, right? And if you need to write the whole thing out, write the whole thing out, but at least have this. Right? When you see manganese, you're like, all right, transition metal, so it's got to be past 4s, right? So when I go, I say 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d, and I count, right? Now, if they tell you, if they draw it out for you, that's even better. And if they tell you like this, identify that specific electron, they gave you two of the answers already. 3p. So n equals 3, n, l equals, what's p? It's 1. They gave you two of the answers already. So now all you got to do is put 0 in the middle, positive 1, m, l equal positive 1, and then you know it's spin up, so it's m, s equals 1 half. 1 half. Another very, very high yield question that comes in along with this, right, is which of the following is an impossible set of quantum numbers? That's a very common question that's asked on the MCAT, right? So what we're going to do for just one second, for just one second, because I, want, I really want to drill this home, and it's not something I did to study. I just kind of practice these questions over and over and over again. And also, like, I have, we were talking about this earlier, there's like a, everyone's sort of naturally inclined towards one specific area of study. Chemistry is my one specific area of study that I'm naturally inclined towards, so I didn't need as much practice with this. But this is a very good way of getting this su stuff clear in your head. Let's begin at n equals 1, and go to n equals 2, and then go to n equals 3. And they probably will not ask you about n equals 4, because the, as much as the MCAT loves the d orbital, the MCAT hates the f orbital. right? They don't go anywhere near it. All right, so for n equals 1, what we're going to do, for, for each of these, actually, we're going to write out the possible domains of all of, the other, of all the other numbers. OK? So for L, the domain goes up to n minus 1, correct? So for L, the only thing here could be 0, right? And the reason for that is because this denotes the s orbital. And at n equals 1, you only have the s orbital, which is why the first row on the periodic table only has two elements, right? ML, once again, ML is a sublevel. There's only one sublevel of the s orbital, right? So that would be 
0. ms is always the same. Negative 1 half, positive 1 half, inclusive. For n equals 2, l can equal 0 or 1 going up to n minus 1. This is the s and the p orbital. Now that we added the p orbital, the ml, we know that the ml for the s orbital can only be 0. But the ml for the p orbital has now expanded. So here is the 0 from the s orbital. And now the p orbital has expanded to the left and to the right, which means we go from 0 to negative 1, 0, positive 1. So this is negative 1, negative 0, negative 1, 0, positive 1. And the ms is always the same. n equals 3. l equals 0, 1, 2. The d orbital takes what the p orbital did and adds, look, look, the 0, add, add. We're going to add one more on each side. Negative 2, negative 1, 0, positive 1, positive 2. And the ms stays the same. same. If you'd like to take a photo of the board, please do. Make sure you get my good side. Kidding. I don't have a bad side. Right, so what is the question going to look like? They're going to give you an array of these numbers, and they're just going to run through them. And some of them are going to say 2, 1, plus 1, plus 1 half. Right? And some of them are going to say 1, 0, 0, negative 1 half. Then it's going to say 2, 2, or sorry, 3, 2, 2, 1 half. And one of them is going to say 2, 1, negative 2, 1 half. That's the problem, when you jump through those ranks. Because remember, you can jump down. You can go 2, 1, 0, 1 half, because the 0 is still here. You just can't go forward. You can't hop to the right and come back. Right? Once you're forward, you're forward. You, you cannot you know, do that. So that's going to be the question. Does that make sense? Do you guys kind of understand what the question is going to look like? Right. That comes up quite often. Let's talk about a question that every single MCAT student hates. Who's not camera shy? Come here. And you too. Come here. Both? Yep, both of you. <coughs> now you're good. My vision is just not good from that angle. You're going to do those. What am I going to do? I'll tell you. I think I have a periodic table here, actually. Oh, there it is. Right next to the rat trap. That's good. If I don't come back tomorrow, you guys know why. <laughs> You're going to do those. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put up a PR table right here. 
Not fucking Safari. Get off my screen. Here is a periodic table. And I want you guys to tell me for each of those. You can refer to the PR table as much as you want. And this is all the information you need. For each of those, put them in order of increasing radius. Radius? Increasing radius. Go. Lowest to highest? Lowest to highest. Write them out at the bottom. Just write them out. Lowest to highest. Just right across the bottom. Covering it up, that's right, okay. right, right. Because okay. this is my hair now. Right, exactly. I have hair like you. You got longer hair, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this could be really like, you know, a compliment. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So, huh? You guys back. Oh, hell yeah. Who do we agree with? Because I see one answer on the board that is correct. That's not mine. <laughs> look at her. Look at her. Who do we agree with? <laughs> you agree with him? Do you agree with him? Who do you agree with? <laughs> you agree with him? Nicole? I'm like dipping to the girl supporting girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yay! Girl supporting girl. No, I definitely got it wrong. I, I don't remember. Oh, wait, what? So, Laura. I don't remember anything about reasons. You agreed with him. So, you can sit down. Oh. And I'm going to tell you that he's correct. Okay. And now, I want you to tell me mm. why he's correct. Mm. Look at what he wrote down mm. and tell me why he's correct. And because. It's not a problem. You just you just forgot the methodology behind this. Yeah. And that's fine. Just tell me why he's correct. Look at the periodic trends and tell me why he's correct. Okay, so Na and Mg are over here, and mm -hmm. then O and F are over here. Well, not on the same level. Oh, yeah. Do I feel like oh, I should oh, just do this? Right here. Oh, yeah. It's okay. Okay. And then O and F are above that, right? Right, yeah. And what's so splitting them? What's right here? What's the noble gas that's right there? Can we just fix this up real quick? Is that oxygen a noble gas? Oxygen's not a noble gas. Oxygen is a calcogen. Well, it's not splitting them. Oh, you mean splitting this and this? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, right. I didn't, I didn't. There was there was one little thing off about that. Sorry. I, thought, like, the, I looked I looked at the beginning and I was like, okay, he's got it. <laughs> I looked at the two and I thought that was part of the oxygen. Oxygen. Right, right, right. So doesn't radius? I thought radius increased going down. It does. Okay. Right, but that that is atomic radius. Mm -hmm. We are not talking about ionic radii. Well, you didn't specify that. <laughs> what do you mean? These are ions. <laughs> what? All right. Okay. So. So now that we know that they're atom ato ionic radii, what's to be said about these and what's to be said about these? So I want you guys to remember that whenever you're working with radius questions, you are working with not a question of the electrons, really, but a question of the protons. The protons are really what matters, right? So what we're looking at here, as Laura so neatly drew on the board, mm -hmm. Magnesium has the greatest number of protons, followed by sodium, followed by fluorine, 
followed by oxygen. Right. Now, if this were strictly an atomic radius problem, the answer would be completely different. The answer would be absolutely different. What would be the answer then? If we had oxygen, fluorine, and then neon, and then over here, sodium and magnesium. Well, since sodium and magnesium have the third, sorry, the, yeah, the third energy level, right? Since sodium and magnesium have the third energy level, they're automatically larger than anything above them. Because remember, I want you to think that this is the nucleus, this is the first energy level, this is the second energy level, third energy level is in fucking Ohio, right? It's, it's so far away. It's massive. So now, it, they are just blowing these out of the water. And then between oxygen and fluorine, what's larger? Well, remember that I said every time you gain a proton, the proton, it's almost like turning a little gear that pulls the electrons towards it. So the fluorine would be smaller than the oxygen. Now, when we make these ions, they lose their third energy level, but, but they maintain the number of protons. So if they only have two energy levels, right, and they have more protons than both of those, wouldn't the one with the most protons be the smallest? So that would be magnesium, two plus. Then sodium, one plus. And since they all have the same number of electrons, same number of energy levels, whatever, what's next? Then fluorine, then oxygen. Oxygen would be the largest. Does that make sense? So then it would be potassium, potassium. Same thing. Same exact trend, just in a different right, energy one, level. One in a different energy level. Exactly. Thank you, guys. It's, I, wrote, I wrote this wrong. It's O2 minus. Because this is, this is peroxide. Or sorry, it's O2, 2 minus. That's peroxide. Thank you, guys. Give it up for our lovely students. I was talking to Mr. Stewart about that the other day, where I was just like, um, it's so difficult, actually, like being a teacher and standing here and like teaching. Because if I forget something, yo, you, got, you guys are fucked. Like, I'm not screwed. I'll remember at some point. You guys are screwed. Because I remember I was teaching you guys the Doppler effect, and I just completely forgot that velocity is included in the Doppler effect. And then I, I just spoke for like three, four minutes without putting the velocity into the equation. I was like, wow, that's not good. Well, thank you guys for making my job a little bit easier. You guys know the whole ionization energy, like, Electronegativity, blah, 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 whatever, whatever, right? Do we need another section for that? Eh. It's not, it doesn't really come up all the time. What do you mean? Like the acceptance of ionization energy. What exceptions? Like the, you know, the... Like the drops of the noble gases and yeah. stuff like that? Yeah, so I, I guess we can talk about that. So for ionization energy, just understand that when the noble gases, like, so for IE, if you have the periodic table, it's a little castle, right? IE will always go up that way. And when you hit the noble gases, it's going to like go up, 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 up. And that's a noble gas. And it's going to crash down and go up, 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 up. That's a noble gas and crash down. And go up, 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 noble gas, crash down. And as you crash down, you're going to crash down to a lower and lower and lower point every time you start a new period, right? Because the energy levels are further and further away from the nucleus. For electronegativity, just remember that the electronegativity bottoms out when you have a noble gas. So it's like going up. Electronegativity goes up, 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 up. That's the noble gas. So for ionization energy, this is the noble gas. For electronegativity, this is the noble gas. Also, what's the difference between electron affinity and electronegativity. Electron affinity and electronegativity. Very, very, very good. And negativity is how much energy is in the 
No, so electronegativity isn't a measure of energy. It is a measure of relativistic comparison, right? So we say, what is our basis for comparison? So let's go on the easiest point. What's our basis for comparison for acidity? It's the acidity of what? The acidity of hydronium. We always go off of the acid dissociation of hydronium. And I'm just going to write So that now you guys know those are two different compounds. This is radioactive, and you can see the radioactive hydrogen hopped over to the radioactive water. That's our basis for the acidity, right? We have to base it in something. So this is our standard of comparison. What's our standard of comparison for electronegativity? It is the carbon to hydrogen bond. Not because we randomly said, hey, that one's nonpolar. It's because by the laws of physics and chemistry, it is nonpolar. When you look at the bond under a specific type of machine or whatever the fuck they use to determine polarity, when you look at it, a carbon to hydrogen thing, like something like this, it just registers zero. Even though there is a difference in how strong this pulls the electrons versus this pulling the electrons, the register is zero, right? The register is zero for some reason. But the real difference is 0 0.5. 0 0.5 in units, right? Now, here's the thing, right? Anything greater than 0 0.5, we're going to call polar. Greater than 0 0.5 meaning what? The electronegativity difference. The difference in the electronegativity, right? Anything greater than 0 0.5 is polar up until what? 0 0.5 less than x less than 1.7. 1.7. And then above 1.7 is ionic. Iconic. Ironic. She got the joke. <laughs> Don't out me like that. <laughs> Ionic, right? Anything less than 0 0.5 is going to be nonpolar. So our basis of electronegativity and polarity is based on the carbon to hydrogen bond, which is an electronegativity difference of 0 0.5. And I believe the actual electronegativity, like the, the, the function of electronegativity, is based on carbon, I think. I'm not 100% sure. OK. Who remembers? What's that? Acetone. It's acetone. It's a ketone, right? Am I allowed to do this? Fuck no. Fuck no. But am I allowed to do that? Why? D orbital, right? D orbital. David, welcome back to the game. Also, I'm bald now. <laughs> so the p the phosphorus is a third period element, right? So what part of the periodic table should you know by heart? B, C, N, O, F, C, L, B, R, I, S, P, S, I, A, L. By heart. If you stand any chance of doing well on the chemistry section, you know that by heart. And you know every trend as well.
So phosphorus is a third period element because this is our 2p block, this is our 3p block. And when the 3p's get bored and tired and they want to hook up with more people, they just dip into the d orbital and they're like, here you go, take some space, and boom, that happens, right? All right. So here's the next question, because this wasn't really the hard question. Sorry, David. Okay. Makes total sense, right? This is the same thing. Double bond three, double bond three. Happy, happy, happy. No, no charges, nothing. Charges resolved. One, two, three, four. Good, right? Why? Hold that thought. Hold that thought. Once everyone has a thought about why, we'll answer the question. I think I know. Nicole, what do you think? Laura, <laughs> she phoned a friend. Laura, what do you think? Steric hindrance doesn't favor the, the one with the double bond. Steric hindrance where? I like that idea. You're on the right track. David. One of these? Right? So you think it's you think this might be interceding on the double bond, something like that, okay? Tom? Yeah, maybe that's the pi bond. Pi bond, right? Yeah. Nothing? <laughs> Nothing? Um it's the size of the P orbital much different than the size. Okay. P orbital. Okay. So we got a sort of entropy thing, enthalpy thing going on over there. Nothing? What do you think? Give it, give it a crack. Anything. Hypothesize. Oh, it's just the All right. Oh, the Wittig reaction. Actually, I think that's where this is from. So the Wittig reaction is a really good example of when this happens. So it's like, oh, that's the one with like the four, the square thing. This is exactly where that happens. So this is, yes, good, very good. So this is, where this comes up is the Wittig reaction, where you have like a square and there's a, there's a carbon and a phosphorus next to one another and they don't, re they don't really do this. The reason they don't do it is because carbon is a 2p element. He was correct. And phosphorus is a 3p element. So when you look at the p orbital of a 2p element, it's going to look like this. And then when you look at the p orbital of a 3p element, it's going to look like this. And what you need for p orbitals to bond is for them to be in phase. You need this part to kiss this part. My guy, there's an innuendo, there's an innuendo here that I'm not going to get into, all right? She's been around town. She hasn't. We're not going there. This is statutory right here, all right? <laughs> if you don't get it, you don't get it. If you don't know, you don't know. This is, this is statutory right here. This is not allowed. She has to be arrested. <laughs> right. Pick on someone your own size. So that is not allowed because the P orbitals, remember, here's what, what's actually going on. When those have to bond, I have to speak up for the people back home. When those have to bond, 
You have to take the top and bottom phase of the P orbitals and click them together like this. When one is much larger than the other, it's not going to be able to click. It just, it just can't. It's not going to be able to reach under and connect with the phase of that P orbital. It's not possible, right? So that's why that doesn't happen. Okay. That has come up in like the 6,000 MCAT questions I've done. It has come up once. <laughs> but if it comes up again, you're never going to forget it. What's up? Why is it still like a 50% chance that, you know, if you don't type it, it's on, it's still MCAT? Probably just that, like, you know how, you know how in any sample of, um, a, like, a molecule at a specific temperature, let's say it's temperature T, you have those versions of the molecule that are, like, all, way, all the way out here, and it's, like, 0. 0.0001% of the molecule. Like, this probably accounts for, like, the temperature of 3% of the molecules. So some of them just have enough energy to do that 3% of that connection. Because if you put enough energy into anything, anything will happen. Right. Fuck, you, you go to the sun, you can fuse hydrogen atoms together, right? Like, some people don't like those very raunchy connections that I make within my lessons. But then I ask them a couple weeks later, I'm just like, hey, what is this specific topic? They're like, oh, yeah, it's that. That's why I do it. Hate me if you must. Parents, go fuck yourself. No. <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> Don't you guys have kids to raise? <laughs> Acid base. We got our boy, Bronsted. Lowry, poor Lowry, always gets left out. We got our guy, Lewis. Bronsted Lowry is all about what? Protons. Protons, right? That's stuff like this. Proton donor, proton acceptor, right? Conjugate base, conjugate acid, right? Lewis, all about the electrons. electrons. That's more of the stuff that gets real juicy. The best example of this is a carbocation, always. I will always, always, always default to the carbocation. Specifically, the carbocation in the intermediates of an SN1 reaction. The intermediate of an SN1 reaction is the perfect example of a Lewis acid base reaction. Electron poor electrophile. Electron rich nucleophile. Electron donor, electron acceptor. Electron pair donor, electron pair acceptor. Conjugates are a little tougher when you're looking at Lewis stuff. Because if you ask me, right, this is the acid, this is the base. So where's the conjugate, right? The conjugate base is actually this bond right here. And the conjugate acid is that oxygen that's bearing the positive charge. Because if you do the reaction in reverse, you see that the electron donation goes from the bond to the oxygen. So the electron pair donor is the bond, and the electron pair acceptor is the oxygen. Conjugate base, conjugate acid. Gets a little tricky. No, no, they would not. But, but it's just for your own knowledge. Lewis acid accepts electrons. Acid. That is why. I like that you asked that. That is why when you do, when you do
an SN1 reaction. It's okay to have a little acid in this flask. It might even be preferable because you're going to make acidic conditions. Well, when you're doing an SN2 reaction, you're going to use a base. You're going to use a base. And what type of solvent? A polar aprotic solvent, like DMSO. THF, diethyl ether, right? Chlorhorm works. Just don't sniff it. I was working in a, on a lab in high school chemistry. And it was like that one where you take a little like plate of hydrochloric acid, you drop magnesium into it and you watch it bubble and think, yeah, oh yeah. Right, so we're, we're using like the most dilute hydrochloric acid known to man and the shittiest oxidized piece of magnesium ever. So me and my buddy, uh, my lab partner back, back in the day, um, he, we have a little watch glass. So there's the crucible, and it's filled with a little bit of hydrochloric acid, and we have a little piece of magnesium. We, he drops it, and we put a watch glass over it so the fumes don't like get out and whatever. And I'm looking over the watch glass. like So here's the watch glass, and here's the experiment. I'm looking. I, they probably can't hear me. I'm looking over the watch glass like this. My brother in chem decides to take a pair of tweezers and just lift up the watch glass at that moment. And it just so happened that I was inhaling at the exact moment he did, and I just inhaled all the vapors. My entire lunch tasted like vinegar that day because all I could taste was hydrochloric acid. It was not good. If it were a college level class, I would have third degree burns on the inside of my fucking esophagus. So thank God we were not in college. What high school? I went to high school on, on Long Island, oh. some public high school. I did tell you guys at the time that um, that girl in my orgo lab um, put a vial, like an Erlenmeyer flask of ether on the boiling plate, like directly on the boiling plate, and then it set on fire but it was under the hood, so the flame was getting fed by the hood. And then it like, so here's the little Earl in my flask. And it started out as a flame this big, and then it just got fed and fed and it fed. And there was this two foot column of flame just inside the fume hood. And <laughs> they're freaking out, we're freaking out. I'm look, I, so I'm on the other side of the room, I'm looking over. All I can see above their heads is the fucking wispy flame coming out of the ether that's on the boiling plate. And we call the professor, and the professor just looks over, and he's just like, <laughs> looks at the floor, just shakes his head. Because what are you going to do? You have to let it burn. You're not going to go interrupt it. Like, if you try to go pick it up, you might drop it. It might explode the fire. Just let it burn. And the worst part was, it was the last step of the lab. It was to boil off the ether. So all of her product was destroyed. It was horrible. A horrible sight. Not good. Anyways, there's one more example of uh, Lewis acid base theory that I want you guys to be a bit familiar with. <clears throat> and that is something like this. When you have the d orbital that peaks up and down out of a transition metal, right? And then you have a non-metal that can take its electron pair and go like that. What is that type of bond called? It's called a coordinate bond. This is called a coordinate covalent bond. And the reason for that is because all of the electrons come from one species, right? So you think this would be ionic, but the oxygen is in control of the electrons the entire time. It doesn't give the electrons to the iron, right? Number one. And number two, it's covalent because technically they're sharing, but it's more of a loan from the oxygen. Technically they're sharing, 
but it's more like a loan. Because a covalent bond would be like that is a true covalent bond. They're sharing. And one is the hydrogens, and one is the oxygens, and they're sharing. They might be sharing unequally, but they're sharing, right? They are not sharing. He is loaning, right? That is a coordinate covalent bond. And this is the way that oxygen floats around in your body. Does that only happen when there's metals? Pretty much. Pretty much. Though the way you're going to see it, at least. Uh, you can get into the whole thing of crystal field theory and the phosphatidylcholines and the phosphatidylethanolamine, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Like, you could go back to the, the one lecture in Gen Chem 2 that Dr. Shiskowska made on all this stuff, and you can be like, oh, no, it's not only metals. It's not only... Fuck yourself. Like, no, I'm not going back there. I made it... I worked too damn hard <laughs> for the past six years to go back there. By the way... I just finished my second year of medical school. <laughs> if you're wondering why I'm not happier, it's because I have to take step in four weeks. <laughs> uh, are we okay with stoichiometry, like moles, grams, mole conversions, blah, blah, blah? Like, I know that was rough at the beginning, but now it's just second nature, right? It just comes and goes and comes and goes, comes and goes, right? Uh, bop, 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 bop. Types of reactions, combustion reactions, double replacements, single replacements, redox reactions. Cool? Good? Can you repeat like covalent bonds by covalent Oh, right, right, right. Like intermolecular forces. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Let's do that. That's actually a good place to go. So the lowest level of intermolecular forces is what? The van der Waals forces, or the London dispersion forces. Everything has these. And the London dispersion force is contingent upon what? The existence of an electron cloud. If you have a polarizable electron cloud, what's going to happen is as those two come together, the electrons are going to repel. And this one's going to go this way, and this one's going to go this way. And then that's going to cause a small change in polarity. And the molecule next to it is going to change in polarity. And the molecule next to it is going to change in polarity. And they're all going to adjust themselves and exist in this mishmash of things that's constantly just making all of those charges and separations work. Right? OK? This is the two bros sitting in a hot tub five feet apart because they're not gay. Right? Like, they're, they're, not trying, they're not trying to touch. So they're just going to keep repelling and coming back and repelling, come back repelling. Right? That's what that is. Then we have what? Not yet. We have this and a dipole. Dipole induced dipole. So here is a dipole. And this is a neutral, right? And as these come together, the positive here is going to attract the electrons this way. And slowly over time, you're going to build a partial negative charge over here. And you're going to build a partial positive charge over here. As you can see, they, as they move closer, right? Because this one's going to attract all the electrons and push away. And at some point, they're going to get pushed apart again, come back, push apart again, come back, blah, 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 whatever. Right? Yes? OK. Next. Simple enough. They line up like that. Quick question. Is there anything wrong with that? There's something horribly wrong with this. It's not a dipole-dipole interaction. That's a hydrogen bond. This 
is a dipole dipole interaction. Next, hydrogen bonds. Or this is where, this is where, I don't know if ion dipole comes before hydrogen bonds or if ion dipole comes after hydrogen bonds. I've always been, I've personally, pers like I could totally be wrong because who the fuck am I to speak on this? I have not done any research in this realm. But I think that the ion in and of itself is like catastrophic in like dispersing, uh, dispersing uh, charges. So I always put the hydrogen bond right before the ion dipole. The H bond. No. The H bond. No Oppenheimer. Not this time. The H bond. So HF, HN, HO, all of these are donors to what? A, a lone pair on oxygen, a lone pair on nitrogen, and a lone pair on fluorine. Donors and acceptors. Correct? Next. Ion dipole. Actually, ion induced dipole, and then ion dipole, and then. So I think ion induced dipole would go over here, and then ion dipole would go over there. Maybe. Something. But within these top four, you have. Ion induced dipole, which is just, and then that is going to attract electron clouds out of a neutral substance and create a partial negative and a partial positive. The reason I draw them in dots is because they're not there yet. It's forming, right? And then the ion dipole, which is And then the ion ion. The strongest attraction of them all, and the tastiest. Technically, Techn because because the thing is, uh, it's tough. Yeah, like this is the way I was taught. I don't necessarily know if this falls under intermolecular force because they're interatomic or interionic, right? But I assume that if you have like a molecule where there's a cofactor, right? And one of the cofactors is an ion, another one of the cofactors is another ion, and those two ions attract, it could be an intermolecular force in that sense. But just know that it's the strongest type of attractive force there is, second only to the love I have for medicine. That is the strongest attractive force of all. Well, right? That's why I'm not married yet. What time is it? 8.30? All right, let's do one more thing and then... We'll debrief. Mm. Honestly, the rest of it is either like I've washed it, I've like fucking just plowed it into your guy's head so hard that we don't really need to go over it anymore. Like, do I need to tell you what a fucking equilibrium constant is anymore? No, I don't. <laughs> And then the rest of it is like batteries, and we have an entire lecture on batteries. Like, that was only 20 minutes long, so I don't feel like a review of that is necessarily warranted. One thing we should go over, though. Right? Someone give me another one. And David, give me the last one. All of these are interchangeable, correct? Right. That one up top, this guy.
Also, she's not here today, but shout out to Sarah for the markers. Okay. Who's not camera shy? Not you. You had your turn. David, think you can do it? Between positives and negatives, fill them out for me. And if you guys see him filling something wrong, you start booing him. Boo. <laughs> mm, a lot of pressure. Talk through it. Uh, so if you want to have always negative, we need to have delta G, delta H negative, and delta S positive. If we want to have always positive, we want to have delta H positive and delta S negative, because double negative is going to equal to positive. At a high temperature, want to have delta H mm, positive? Mm, nope, it should be negative at a high temperature. Negative? Oh. I got it. <laughs> All right, it should be positive. And Why? Because if we're going to increase the delta S. Exactly, so we're, if, the, if the temperature is going to be high, yeah. It's going to be a delta S driven process, right? Mm -hmm. so, so the delta S is the one that's favorable. And we know that increases in entropy are favorable, favorable. right? And if the temperature is low, it is a delta H driven process. And that means yes. we want the delta H to be favorable, which is negative. negative. If the temperature is low. If the temperature is low, yep. The negative. Delta H. Oh. Delta H negative, this one is, should be, oh, it's negative. Very good. <laughs> Very good. Um, now, while you're up there, what does it mean for a process to be delta G negative? It's spontaneous. What does that mean? It's going to occur without any energy input. But is it necessarily going to happen no. No. There are spontaneous processes that could take hundreds of years, thousands of years. There are spontaneous processes that could take forever. The rusting of iron is a spontaneous process. You don't pick up a piece of iron and then immediately go, Ugh! right? Like, like it just, just doesn't happen. Thank you. Very Oops. good job. Thank you. Very good job. So you don't pick up a piece of iron and immediately just watch it turn into fucking disgusting stuff, right? It happens slowly, over time. It develops. It is a very slow, insidious reaction, right? There's a word in medicine. Oh, I can't believe I'm blanking on it. I, I literally just took my exams like two weeks ago. Indolent. Indolent. When we say that a disease has an indolent course of action, it takes a long time to come through. Right. So, not all spontaneous processes are fast. Not all spontaneous processes are slow. There are some that are very fast and there are some that are very slow. Huh? Yes. I feel like this one is wrong. Which one? Like always um, not negative or always positive. Always positive. Well, if this is always negative, the flip would always be positive. If both of these are unfavorable, there's no way it can ever be spontaneous. Now, Someone tell me, translate this, and then we're gonna go, and then we're gonna go debrief after this. This is it. This is the end of the rapid review. Because I told you it would take a while. I told you guys it would take some time, the Gen Chem rapid review. Translate these into English for me. 
The first one? What's the word? Exothermic. What's your question? Oh, yeah. So whichever one here is favorable, it's driven by that, right? Because if you let, like, let's say, let's say that you have a friend who is terrible at driving. You're not going to let him drive the car. This guy sucks at driving. He's not, he, how is a delta H negative going to get the delta G the destination it wants to go to? It's delta S driven. So when the delta S is favorable, you want the temperature to help it be favorable, right? You want the temperature to pick it up. But when the delta S is stupid, you want the temperature to be like, yo, shut the hell up. Like, what are you doing? Like, you want the temperature to calm down. You know what I mean? Delta S versus delta H driven. So it's enthalpic versus entropic favorability. So exothermic, and that would mean this is endothermic. And this means hot flask, cold flask, absorbing from the environment, releasing into the environment. What about these? Yes, but there's another term. There's a chemistry term. David? No, there's another term. No, there's a term. No. No. There you go. Endergonic, exergonic. How are you going to remember? It has a G in it. it. Has a G in it. I feel like that wasn't so bad, right? This is one of the easier lessons we've had. It was just walk down memory lane. And then next week, or next time on Thursday, we'll do orgo. And that will not be a sweet walk through memory lane. Oh. Orgo rapid review, we will probably be here for two and a half hours. OK, so be prepared. Come with questions, please. Look over your Orgo notes. Find UWorld questions. Or no, we don't you do UWorld questions here. It's not allowed. <laughs> um, find UWorld questions that are free and offered in their free subscription. Find questions from the sample exams that you take, blueprint free exams, blah, 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 whatever, that we can go over. Um, find you know, any sort of part of the notes where you may have fallen asleep. And I'm serious. Like, I, I won't take any offense. It's like, hey, the first time you explained this, you didn't do it too well. Or I didn't really get it. Or I wasn't following or something. Bring it. I'll explain it. We'll go through it. Because next time, I would like it to be our farewell to Orgo. Because out of everything we covered, it is probably the least impactful on the MCAT. So we will spend one rapid review on it. Because remember, we did bio, we did biochem, this is gen chem. We did bio one, biochem one, gen chem one. Orgo is going to be one and done. Hit it and quit it. We're gone. Horgo, legit, leave her in the dust, right? So that's it. Bring all your questions next time. And for everyone back home, thank you for keeping up. Good night.